And we recognize you're already you're here. You're here. I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. And I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. My heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary and yes I praise and I lift you up and I magnify your name that's why my heart is filled with prayer that's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with praise. heart filled with praise will oftentimes reflect in hands raised in praise or hands clapped in praise. So won't you bless the Lord tonight? Would you join with me in prayer? God, our Father, we thank you for this uh, another evening you've given us to assemble in your house. And to delight ourselves in the study of your holy and your righteous word. Father, we come tonight grateful, thankful for the grace and even the mercy in which you have bestowed upon us and that's made this moment possible. God, we thank you that things are as well with us as they are. For we recognize, oh God, that there are many in this world whose life, 
people's life experience is certainly less fortunate than ours. So truly our hearts are filled with praise because of your bountiful blessings toward us. Father, there are many who are connected to us, the Lord, who are in fights of faith as they deal with various conditions and situations that we must go through as a result of living in this world. So, Father, we want to take a few minutes to ask you to allow your hand of love, your hand of mercy, your healing hand, your corrective hand, your directing hand, to touch the lives of those who stand in, in need. God, we thank you tonight that Sister Chevelle is in the house. And she and her family are wrestling with the loss of a loved one. We ask you tonight to strengthen her, let something be said, will cause her, dear Heavenly Father, to hold and cling tightly to your love toward her and her family. Lord, be, your, be their comfort in this time of bereavement. God, we asked, not only would you hold that family in your arms, but God, we know your arms are big enough to hold the Fleming family as well. We ask that you touch them, oh God, as they prepare to lay to rest their loved one. But Lord, we, we know that that's a family of faith. And so we pray, oh God, that by some means you would allow them to, to look to you, to remember who you are, who you've been, how you've worked in their lives. Help them be mindful of your faithfulness. Help them to know that you're not going to leave them, nor will you forsake them. Be their comfort, O oh God, as only you can. And Father, we ask that you allow to, to be close to your bosom, the long family, as they too deal with the loss of life. And Father, there's even another family that we heard that is connected to us, Lord. It's lost a loved one as well. We know that we didn't come into this world to stay. God, we just simply ask that as we deal with the residue of losing loved ones, that you abbreviate the mourning. Let it not penetrate us so, such that we stop living, that we stop hoping, and that we stop rejoicing in the life we have in Christ Jesus. And for every void that's been made by the loss, we seek you, Father, to fill it as only you can. If not with others, dear God, who provide strength and encouragement, God, we ask you to be in the midst like you've never been before. God, we pray for those whose fight of faith is yet still on this side. We lift up to you, Sister Rosie, God. We ask that you would touch her body and strengthen her we ask that you would strengthen the family to be in their faith. We ask that you work with the physicians, the medical industry, to bring about a resolve, dear God, that gives you glory and gives her health. Lord, we ask that you touch Sister Cherie's father, continue to strengthen, to hold, and to keep them. God, we know that there are many others they may escape my frail mind, but, they, but not your eyes. We know that you are an omniscient God. And you know all things. You know all about every circumstance, even those that we have hidden and harbored in our heart that we may not speak of, we may not share, but, oh, God, we know you know. And we pray to God that as you, as you pierce even the, the crevices of our heart, dear God, let us not allow you to, to be God even in those circumstances. Our faith looks up to thee. We thank you, God. We know that when we lay our burdens down, when we cast our cares upon you, Lord, we have been lightened of a load to which you can handle. And we trust you, God, 
We trust that you're going to work all things out for the good of those who love you. Those who are called according to your purpose. God, we ask that, that you bless this church. God, our desire is that you would send a fresh presence, a fresh anointing. That we might begin to look to you like we've never looked to you before. That we may be able to exalt you and magnify you to God with a brand new spirit, a, re a renewed spirit, a rejoicing spirit. God, let us be mindful of the fact that our lives are lived in Christ Jesus. And because of such, we can stand in hope. We can trust that you'll help. We can find the Heavenly Father a reason to pursue holy living because of who you are in our lives. God, many of the issues we deal with are, have nothing to do with health. There's some father who are just tired some who are weary, some who are, who are confused. But today, oh God, we just want you to see our hearts and bless our lives according to your will. Now, as we prepare our hearts to study your word tonight, we pray, oh God, that you would bless those who are in the building and even those who joined us on Zoom mm -hmm. to grow in grace and in the knowledge of truth, and the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, to begin to see our lives like we've never seen it before, and to embrace the life that you have called us to live. Our desire is not to just be readers and those who hear of the word, but we want to become doers. So let the word be made flesh in our lives. And we thank you in advance. Father, I yield myself to you yet again. Be reckless with me if you must. But sir, whatever you do, take not your spirit away. This we pray in Jesus' name, and all in agreement would say amen. Can y'all give God a praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we greet you as always in the matchless and the marvelous name of Jesus the Christ. Um, y'all give God praise as our, as our young, our babies head out to their class. Hi, Trinity. That's my bookend child right now. I call it my bookend child because I see her first thing in the morning and, and the last thing at night, I see her hair. I don't see it no more throughout the day. But I'm grateful for, for her. Thank you, son. I appreciate your gift tonight. Um, tonight, we're going to add to our series entitled Living from Above and Within. And on last week, we talked a bit about what it means to walk in the light of eternity. And we distinguish the variance between living uh, in the light of eternity and living bracketed by time. And I want you to take and keep in mind those two polarities of existence as we talk tonight about victorious Christian living. I want you to paint in your mind, if you will, a picture of a life that is lived in the light of eternity versus a life that is lived within the brackets of time. Or you'll discover tonight that there are things that happen in time. They are prescribed for time under the banner of things in time that are not or do not have the potency to disrupt your eternal living. And so we're going to talk about when we when we allow our eternal living to overcome our timed living, you can call that being victorious in Christian living. You're with me? Now, I want to, again, uh, remind you of what we've learned in our last lesson, and that is eternity 
does not begin for us when we die. Uh, eternity does not begin for us when we enter or get to heaven. Eternity begins for us when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We become new creatures who now live in Christ, and as a result, we live, uh, we are living the eternal life. We just get to live it in time. And because we're living the eternal life in time, time is always counter to our living. Did y'all did y'all catch me? Time is always counter to our living. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So um, our objective with this lesson is to explore the factors which hinder and prohibit what I reference as a winning walk in Jesus Christ, a winning walk in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to begin with a quote. If you got a, got a pen, a piece of paper, you're taking notes with, we're grateful for those of you who are with us on Zoom tonight. Uh, if you're taking notes, I want to give you this quote. I want you to write it down and I want you to, to chew on it, think about it over, over the next couple of weeks. And the quote says this, resting in what God has done is harder than receiving what God has done. I'll repeat it again. Resting in what God has done is harder than receiving what God has done. Y'all got it? Those of you in the building got to talk back to me because I can't hear those that are on Zoom. Right. All right. Resting in what God has done is harder than receiving what God has done. Got it? All right. So let me let me open this way. Um, so for many in the body of Christ um, or in the church, victorious Christian living has been reduced to that of meeting religious mandates. Um, Y'all can track with me in your handout. Such as church attendance, Bible study, uh, making sure to pray, giving, etc. These things for us um, constitute a ideology that when we do them and we do them uh, consistently, we are we are living the Christian life in a triumphant way. Uh, we are meeting the mandates. Now, the truth of the matter is, for the one who is living triumphantly as a Christian, these things do show up in your life. However, they, 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 they do not confirm, are y'all tracking with me, that you are, you are victoriously living the Christian life, all right? They, they should be present. You should do those things. But don't make the mistake of believing that your doing of those things constitutes, are, are, you, are you with me? In fact, they're more like byproducts. Am I making sense? Then, then they are really the essence of a victorious Christian life. Now, um, tonight, um, I read my Bible. My Bible told me in the book of Genesis that um, Adam couldn't do it by himself. So God put him to sleep and pulled out of him his a rib and his wife as a help meet. And so tonight I've asked my wife to help meet me do the Bible study. Um, and she's going to read some passages. I'm going to give them to you. You can follow along in your Bible. Um, they're not in your handout. That's why I've got her reading them to you tonight. And we're going we're gonna to talk about it. But you, you want to turn to them in your Bible. So I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And um, these verses are going to help us to understand um, a bit about what the Christian life victoriously lived looks like. If it's not coming to Bible study, uh, if it's not coming to church, if it's not, right, all of those things that, that, that are associated with that, then what is it? Then what is it? All right. So I want to begin in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Lady, if you would read verses 35 through 37 
tonight, I would greatly appreciate it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Let's stop here. So the question on the table is who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The ultimate question is what is there that can divide us from what God has done in our lives? What can keep us from that which God has offered to us? Are you, are you tracking with me? What or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then, then there's a list of things. Let's read that again. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, I want you to see these things not in the light, not as specific tasks. Notice that they're broad stroke. They're categorical, right? They're not specific. So if we were to say, again, tribulation, right? There are all sorts of tribulations. So we have categorically tribulation. Is it capable of separating us from the love of Christ? That's the question, right? And then you've got tribulation. You also have what? Distress. That's stress. Or things that stress us, right? Can stress separate us from the love of Christ? Go on. What else? Persecution. Persecution. That's folk messing with you, folk talking to you, things attacking you. Are y'all tracking? Right? These are categorical. Go ahead. What else? Famine. Famine. That's what that's insufficiency. Not having what is needed, right? All of these things that are categorically being expressed. The nakedness, no covering, not, not sufficient covering, things of that nature, all right? What else? Peril. Peril. You know, that, that's stuff that happens to us that catches us off guard, does us damage, threatens our livelihood. And then finally, what else? Sword. Sword, that's attacks, right? Those are things, that, that's conflict, battle. Are y'all tracking with me? They're categorical expressions. They're, 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 they're areas or arenas that 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 the question that's being asked of it us is do, do do they have enough power right to what pull us away from what god has done separate us from what our identity in christ are y'all tracking with me yes all right all right so let's go on as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Let's talk about this. As it is written, th th this saying somewhere it is scripted. It is it is an expectation, right, of our existence that we are what? Killed all the day long. That word killed obviously is not making reference to literally taking of our lives, but it is really making reference to the disposition of humanity as a result of being under sin. Are you with me? Yeah. So she gave, gave me that look. All right. So when she looks up over her glasses, I know she might have a question. So, all right. So, 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 so that, that's what it's referencing. This nature of sin, we are persecuted or killed, or we're killed all the day long, right? It says we are accounted, watch this, as sheep for the slaughter. When it says we are accounted, that's a mathematical term that says that somewhere there is a tabulation being made about your existence that has concluded at the end of the day, you're going to be nothing but mincemeat. Are you with me? You're going to be slaughtered. Something, somebody, somewhere is assessing your life. And as they look at your life, in terms of, watch me, y'all, y'all with me? In terms of all of the possibilities, tribulations, distresses, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword, you are under an indictment that you will be killed, right? And somebody is tabulating your life saying, you ain't nothing but meat for the slaughter. Are y'all tracking? Stay with me. So the question is, who shall separate us from the love of God, right, in Christ Jesus? Shall it be this, that, that, this, this, that, 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 that? As we look at it, you ain't nothing but accounted for what? Sleep for the slaughter. Sheep for the slaughter, right? Y'all tracking? That's the imagery until we get to the next verse. Read. 
Nay, in all these things. Stop. Say that again. Nay. Nay. So now the answer has been given to the question. Are y'all tracking with me? Now the question is, what should separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? Now they paint a picture of all these things that categorically the things can fall in. That when somebody looks at it with the naked eye, whoo wee, it sure looks bad for you. Are y'all tracking with me? Right? But then that the answer to the question is nay, nay to what? Oh. All of those things. And <laughs> to the accounting process of the one who's examining your life. Are y'all tracking? Go ahead. Then. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, hold up. Now, this is crazy because this text su suggests to us that when we're dealing with, let me look at the list for tribulations and distresses, persecutions and famines or nakedness or peril or sword that other people or other entities may look at our lives and we appear that we're nothing but what? Ready to be slaughtered. Our connectivity to Christ. Are y'all tracking with me? Our Unity with Christ says about our lives that these things <laughs> do not have the capacity to do what? Destroy us. But they are opportunities. Y'all hear? They are opportunities according to verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that what? Loved us. So the term here, don't miss me, y'all. The term here that's attributed to the one who is victorious in Christian living is conqueror. Let the house say conqueror. And then there's this descriptive word applied to it by the apostle Paul, more than. But at, at, at least you're a conqueror. Are y'all with me? Now, that's what I want you to hold to. The believer in Christ Jesus in this passage is described as a conqueror over all of those categories. And let me pull the house. And this is church, so don't, don't tell me no story. Truth be told, that when you when we find ourselves in one of these categories, oftentimes it's not conquering that we do. I've been preaching. I would say we cry, right? We complain, we throw fits, but it is not our nature, right? It's not our nature to to eminently claim conqueror, and that is because we don't understand that conqueror is the Christian life. <laughs> Are y'all with me? Go to 1 John chapter 5. It, it is really dangerous to be in this Bible study tonight. Perhaps that's why some folks stayed away um, because this Bible study is going to take away from you the ability to be able to um, complain. You're going, you're going to have to be a conqueror. All right, uh, lady, let's do First John 5 and verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Stop. Are you born of God? Mm -hmm. Yes, when you are born again, you are born of God. So the statement about the one who is born of God, the believer, right? Start again, is what? Says what? Just start again. For whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. I mean, that's just kind of categorical. It didn't say, you know, it didn't overcome the job. It, it, it wasn't categorical. In the last reference, we saw some categories. But here, it, it just cut right, right to the quick. You overcome what? The world. the world. So now you have two attributes that have been given to the believer that puts them in the mentality of being victorious in their living. It is conqueror and what? Overcomer. Overcomer. All right. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. 
This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole wide Bible. Isaiah 40. Let's begin at verse 20. Actually, I want to start at verse 28, I think. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? Stop. No, finish that verse. Is that Neither is weary. Yeah, right there. Stop. There is no searching of his understanding. Now, now. I'm going to do this. Why don't you read that again? Read that again because I interrupted you. Read it again. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now, for those of you who've been in class the last couple of weeks, what does that sound like other than Sister Cleveland? I want y'all to know she cheats. She comes to the morning class, gets all the answers. What does that sound like? Read it again, sweetie. You want my glasses? No. Okay. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God. Stop. That the what? Everlasting God. What do we say? Where, where, where are we at? Keep going. Eternity. Yes. This is eternity dialogue. Right? Very good. This is eternity dialogue. I want y'all to get that. Right? Because the invitation to them in time is, has thou not known? Has thou not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the what? Earth. Earth what, what word is that? Remember, remember Eon? You remember that? Olam? Remember those words? That, that's where we're at. We're in, we're in a recall to what? Eternity. Why? Because they've forgotten it. They've forgotten it. They've, the, 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 so, so, so the invitation is to remember what? The eternal disposition. Let's keep reading. They fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not. Faint. Now I want you to start verse 30 again. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. Now watch this. Y'all know I, I said this this morning. You know, you know, seniors always think the youth don't get tired. Right? But but what I, but what I like to, to reference is. Young folk go through the same thing old folk go through. And they feel it the same way. You understand? There are people who are young who are leaving this world from stress. Right? Go back to 29. He giveth power to the faint. Stop. He giveth power to the who? Faint. To the faint. So fainting is, a, is inevitable. You're going to get weary. You're going to be tired. Go on, baby. He gives he give he power. power to the faint uh -huh. and to them that have no might. That's weak. You're going to be weak. You're going to have weak moments. There's going to be weakness. Y'all understand what I'm showing you? In fact, if I were to merge a previous scripture to this, all of that peril and distress and famine is going to lead to these dispositions. Go on. He increaseth strength. But notice what is happening. Because of the eternal disposition you're in, you're having the experience, but you are conquering it. You're having the condition, but you're overcoming it. Because that is the designation of the Christian life. That's where we differ from people who do not have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They fall out, faint, and they're done. Not us. When we feel like fainting, we fall down. Are you understand what I'm teaching? But I, what I'm trying to show into your spirit is that the, the accurate disposition of the Christian believer is not having no failure. It's conquering failure. 
conquering weakness, overcoming conditions. Are y'all tracking with me? Okay, go ahead and finish. Read that one all the way to 31 and we'll be done. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Here it is. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now watch this. That wait upon the Lord, right, is literally, it literally means to serve the Lord in hope, in anticipation, in expectation. So you might be, you might be down, but you don't say you're down. You say you had the first step of getting up. Why? Because of your disposition. You understand that whatever, now watch me, y'all, I don't want you to miss this. Whatever I deal with in the brackets of what? Time. Has, they have a season and a purpose under the heavens. Watch this. And none of it is what? Eternal. That means you're going to get over it. You're going to get through it. You're going to get beyond it. There, there's more for you on the other side of it. But you got to go through it. God, I feel like preaching. Yea, though I walk. But there's a table prepared for me. Oh, Y'all understand what I'm showing you? You got to begin to get, you got to begin to lock that into your spirit that your Christian life is not about climbing the rough side of the mountain. It's about climbing the rough side of the mountain to get over the top of it. All right. Now, y'all with me? All right, go to Matthew chapter 14. Go to Matthew chapter 14. And baby, since you're doing such a wonderful job at reading, I think I will employ you to go beyond those three scriptures I gave you. You can go Matthew chapter 14. <laughs> Y'all don't know, I got to I gotta get it while the getting is good. Matthew 14, um, verse 15 is where I want to talk. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, so let me tell you what I'm going to do with it. Um, verses 15 through 20. Um, there are four bullets there, and I want you to look for these conditions. I may stop her as we go through it and point them out. Um, because what's happening in the lives of the disciples in this passage is that they are failing at living a victorious Christian life. They're failing, right? And there are some things that lead to the failure. And they're just like we are, right? We fail because of these same dispositions. And so I want to point them out um, since our objective is, is to look at those hindrances to our living uh, a victorious Christian life. Okay, uh, begin verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away and they may go into the villages and buy themselves a victory. Let's stop there. What, 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 what can we point out from our previous learnings that we, that we see here? First of all, the text tells us, and when it was evening, right, his disciples came to him saying, Right. So now we're getting ready to get a, a peek into the mentality of the disciples in this situation. Are you all with me? He says this is a desert place. Now, we, we read that as if it's not significant because it's just really a, a fact. Right. That seem, seems seems unimportant. But in reality, it is important because it's talking about how environmental conditions influences our thinking. All right. It is referenced as a desert place, and a desert place is a place of what? Void. Watch this. You already know this. It's a place of famine. Are you, are you with me? Right. So, so ultimately, in this place, there's already this disposition in them that, you know what? We out here in this place. We've seen this in other passages of Scripture, but I won't reference it. So he says, uh, in this desert place, and what? The time, the time is, is now passed. Now, I don't know. They didn't have watches then or clocks that I know of, but they was watching the sundial or something, right? Because now they're, they're, they're in tune to what? What time it is, right? We know, that we know by virtue of these two things that what? They're not what minded? Eternally minded. They're not, etern they're not walking in the light of eternity. 
They're walking in accordance with time. All right, let's, let's look at this. He says, the time is now past. Send the multitude, what? Away. Stop production. That they may go into the villages and what? Buy themselves victuals. And if I was preaching, I'd tell you what's wrong with the disciples is not that they are concerned that these people haven't eaten. They're hungry. <laughs> and they're going, you know, I know this person who's hungry and... <laughs> You know, what should we do? That's their disposition. All right? That's their disposition. They're using somebody else. Oh, God, I got to get out of that to promote their agenda. All right. So look at what, what let, let's go. On. Um, what I want you to know, and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and grab the point now. They're, what they're doing, and I reference this as if you're going to get to the point where you live victorious live life, you're going to have to conquer the crisis of human calculation. Right, you're gonna see this painted throughout there. There's the calculation of time. There's the calculation of the desert place. This their viewpoint of all these things. Um, go ahead, lady, and pick up verse 16. But Jesus said unto them, "They need, they need not depart." Stop. We did y'all see what just happened? Eternity spoke to time. <laughs> Eternity spoke to all of time's problems. Are, are you understand? Right? Y'all have got y'all's head in the wrong place. Now, if you read the scriptures and watch what the disciples have already experienced in the presence of Jesus, you'd be wondering why in the world are y'all acting like you ain't with Jesus? Are, are, are y'all tracking? But they're driven by what? They're driven by time restrictions. Right? Go ahead. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. <laughs> What is the expectation of those who walk with Jesus? What is the expectation? Now, watch this. This is Jesus saying to the disciples, they ain't got to go nowhere, give them some meat. Go ahead. I'm going to leave that right there. And they said unto him, We have here but the loaves and two fish. What are they doing? The five loaves and two fish. I'm sorry. Human calculations. They're doing human calculations again. Go ahead. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass mm -hmm. and took the five loaves and two fishes and looking up unto uh, looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. In verse 18, he said, he, he and it says, uh, bring them hither to me. He said, bring them hither to me. Right. We have to learn how to delegate the dilemma to the Lord. You see what I said? You got to learn how to delegate the dilemma to the Lord. Let me, let me, I don't want you to miss it. Tribulation, persecution, right? That whole list. You have to learn how to delegate the dilemma to the Lord. Peril, famine. Can I tell you? Sickness, disease. Not enough mo money to cover the bills for the month. You have to learn how to delegate the dilemma to the Lord. Now, why? Because after all, you've made him Lord. And since you made him Lord, your problem is really not your problem. It's his. I was talking to uh, Joan earlier this week. I shared this this morning. I was talking to Joan this week about something that we're anticipating happening here in the, in, in, at the church. And uh, when I finished explaining it, with enthusiasm and excitement, her words to me was, that's a tall task. And I said, oh, I'm going to let it marinate. Because y'all looking like she looked. I ain't going to tell you the details. Right? But again, I described it with enthusiasm and excitement. Right? She said, that's a tall task. I said, for who? Because see, when you're engaged in the enterprise of God, it's not your enterprise. It's God's. You just have a role in it. Learn how to delegate the dilemma to the Lord. Ooh. Let's keep going. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments and remained. That remained 12 baskets full. Their problem was 
they did not have proper expectation of the Lord. And you got to learn, I put it on your paper, to expect more from the outcome than can be calculated. Am I making sense? Most times, because we have our trust in our ability or in our resources, we have minimal expectation. And God's expectation will always, and I mean always, exceed our expectation. But can you disposition yourself to the regard where you can have that expectation of God? Because that is the disposition that will allow you, don't miss this, to be more than a conqueror. To be an overcomer. Am I making sense? All right. All right. So, 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 so we'll leave that. All right. Any questions so far? Any questions? Zoom questions? Good. All right. Good. So, so let's, let's, let's turn the corner. All right. All I'm really sharing with you is really how to possess a spiritual mind as opposed to a mind based in time or in the world. Now, I'm going to talk about the mind that overcomes defeating attitudes because that's what most of us have. We have defeating attitudes. When we face a crisis, we face a crisis with a woe, right? Not a yay. If we can learn to face a crisis with a yay, that means, watch this, whatever has come against me, whatever has come to me that I cannot handle, instead of me out of fear being woeful, out of faith I say yay, because now I expect God is getting ready to do something in my life. Watch this. So that what he's doing in eternity manifest in time in my life. Am I making sense? Okay. So one of the things that um, creates a defeated mentality is having a branded mind versus a spiritual mind. Now, I did a long teaching on branded mind, and I think I did a teaching after that on spiritual mind. So we're going to talk a little bit about what I've taught some weeks ago, months ago, um, the branded mind versus the spiritual mind. Y'all with me? All right. So habits are byproducts of experiences which have yielded some personal advantage. Stay with me. To such a regard that the person engaged in the habit is convinced that the habit is essential to existence. I'm going to repeat that. Habits. Let the house say habits. Are byproducts of experiences which have yielded some personal advantage. In other words, what is your habit, right? Is your habit because when you when you did it, you advance. You got an advantage from it, a benefit from it. Are you with me? And and, and the benefit it has been such to such a regard that that you now engage in the habit, right? Consistently because you believe that that habit now is essential to your existence. Does that make sense? Y'all ain't saying nothing. Or are you thinking about your habit? Which one? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, what's, what's crazy is that when a habit becomes perpetual, we begin to define ourselves in accordance with our habit. So we say, say stuff like, that's who I am. You do what you do, and then you say, that's who I am. Am I, am I making sense? It's, it's what I do, right? But what you don't realize is what you're really saying is I've been branded by my habit. Am I making sense? Hmm. And when you've been branded by your habit, watch this. You don't have a habit. The habit has you. So you wake up in the morning, you got a habit. Am I making sense? But you didn't have to have it while you were asleep. My wife is coffee branded. That's why she's laughing. All right. So I want you to listen to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. Are y'all with me? Okay. Here's what it says. It's in your handout. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed 
to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. All right, let's open this up. Y'all ready? So the text said that the spirit speaking definitively as an expression concretely that in the latter times, some shall what? Depart from the faith. Now watch the reason for the departure, the, 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 the departing. Giving heed to seducing spirits. So that the reason See, that's the seducing spirit. The first five times I did that, Brooke said. Six and seven times, she said. When she pointed at herself, I had her. You, 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 you got me? Now, in order for the seduction to work, right, to be beneficial, you have to depart. Are you understanding? So watch this. It is not, it, it is not that we fail at faith. We walk away from faith at the invitation of sedu sed seducing spirits. Are y'all tracking with me? And the text says we give what? Heed. Right? Look at her. See? She ain't coming, right? <laughs> all right. Now watch this. Conquer, right. All right. All right. Watch this, right? So the seducing spirit gets you to depart from the faith. And then as a result of it, you start living in accordance with the seductive spirit. Say amen. Ouch, whichever applies. But you learn what is, watch this. A doctrine of devils. Y'all are mighty quiet. I mean, there's just like a hush in the room right now. Right? And y'all not on Zoom. The doctrine speaks lies. Look at the text. But watch this. The lies spoke, spoken is through those who have been seduced and who have departed the faith. Now, if you've departed the faith, watch this. The doctrine you're speaking will be counter to what the faith speaks. Are you with me? And you, but watch this. But you don't look like it. <laughs> you look like you're in the faith. But you're speaking contradictory to the faith having been seduced by the spirit. How do I know that? Because it says, watch the text, you speak lies in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is what? Saying you're one thing and being something else. Why does that happen? We see how. The why is this. Having their conscience seared with the hot iron. Mine, not blown, but branded. Are you with me? This is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I cope. This is how I handle it. Y'all still here? Wow. All right. So here's the statement I want you to grab. Victory prohibiting habits lead to victory prohibiting attitudes. And they're typically associated with what? Mindsets based in what? Carnality. 
and they must be overcome with what? Spiritual mindedness. That, that's why you want to study the Bible, not so you can memorize verses. So that you can be spiritually minded. Are you tracking with me? All right, lady, go to Romans chapter 8. Y'all can turn there if you want to. You brought your Bibles. This is Bible study. It's saliva. Any questions, Gio? All right. Romans chapter 8. Hmm. Question. Can you die in eternity? How? Because what? Death is for time. Are you with me? What'd you say? No, no. Romans 8, Lady 8, verses 5, 6, and 7. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace Stop. to be carnally minded is what death. death let me tell you something I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this do you know why it is that that too many people are are, are committing suicide it's because they think death all of their thoughts are relative to death all of the, all of their problems Persecution, I'm going to die. Tribulation, it's going to kill me. You understand? We are preoccupied with dying because we're preoccupied with death. But if we're preoccupied with death, it's because we are what? Seared in our conscience. We are carnally minded. All we think about is preventing death. Am I making sense? If a football player, if a, if a running back, all they worried about was being tackled, they would never get in the yard. You got to understand that some things in time, are you with me, are inevitable. There's a time to live and a time to die. Read verse 7 again. Again? Oh, read verse 6 again, I'm sorry. For to be carnally minded is death. Right? It's what? Death. Is what? Death. Okay, keep going. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wait. Did you catch it? The way, the way you get away from suicidal thoughts is you think life thought. You need to take in information that says you shall live and not die. And not die right? You need to understand. Don't miss this. You need to understand that, yes, there will be tribulation, but this did not come to take you out. Right? You all with me? You understand what I'm teaching? All right, let's keep going. Because the carnal mind is eternal. Woo! Against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. The, the carnal mind is enmity. She said enter, enmity, uh, enmity against God. Against God. So watch this. God saves you. I've, I, okay, let me put it this way. How many of you believe God is saved? Right? But how many of you understand? Watch this. How many of you understand that receiving what God has done is easier than what? Resting in what God has done. I know I gave it to you the other way, but it means the same thing. Because, watch this, if you believe he saved you, why can't you rest in salvation? Why is there this preoccupation with all of these things happening that we know are common to the world, but if you've been born of God, you overcome the world? Are y'all understand where I'm at? The reason that we don't experience it is because we don't believe it here. 
We have not been seared to the point where we've been taught, watch this, you will be victorious over this. Y'all still here? All right. Um, so, where'd you stop? Seven? All right. Let me say this. Um, carnal mind is enmity against God. Right? That, that simply means that anytime we embrace the world's perspective or value relative to the world, it puts us in direct opposition to God. Now watch this. It doesn't change what God has done for us. It changes how we react to it. Are you understand? You either, oh my God, it's going to be over, or this situation has come that I might be what? One of two things. A conqueror or an overcomer. All right. Um, so I think, just Cleveland, this is far we got this morning. You remember? I got about five, ten minutes. I, I don't know what to do. As y'all know, I want to keep teaching, but if I keep teaching, well, I'll keep teaching. Y'all want to go, y'all want to go on? Who said no? Go on. But brother, go get her mic and take it to her because there are people who are on Zoom who think I'm just walking around saying nothing and talking to the air. And I want them, I want them to think I'm. Are y'all trying? Y'all got any questions? Other than, get some questions because if I start teaching, I'm, I might go over to eight o'clock. I don't want to do that. I got a question. All right, hold on. I got one down here on the floor and then I'm coming to you. Go. I was going to say, as Christians, we need to have spiritual affirmation to help us that we, you know, as we begin to say, as we read it, say it, believe it, digest it, the whole nine yards, because we have affirmations for everything else. But if we were to take what you just read about the carnal minded and all that and just say it and believe, you know, that we trust in God for our everything and all things that, you know, our lives will be better. But yeah. I just, when we read that, I thought about affirmation. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 people. yeah. So, so let me respond to that. I'm coming. So let me respond to that because when we talk about what, what you just really introduced was a, a spiritual discipline, right? That is not common within the context of religion. It's not about practice. It's about relationship. Now, what the Bible says, right, is the tongue is the pen of a ready writer. That's why when we speak, what happens, don't miss this, when we speak, what we ultimately do is hear. Now, I think I was this Sunday, I told y'all faith cometh by hearing, right? Now, watch this. When you hear, what happens is what you speak is written on your heart. Out of your heart is how you live. Now, when the Bible speaks of heart, it speaks of a, con a connection between the heart and the head. So as a man thinketh, watch this, no? In his heart, so is he. It is not talking about your organ. It is talking about the seat of your existence. It's really referencing your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your imagination, and your emotion. So what you say, oftentimes you hear. That's why you can't be talking about this is killing me. Because all you're doing is hearing that. And so the more you deal with it, the more you believe. And then it's this thing is wearing me out. It just it took me out. See, be careful what you say. The power of life and death is in your tongue. That's why when you started reading, uh, I don't know what's Romans 1, past, you said, to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. That's it. If you pursue the spirit, Right. You can't pursue the flesh. So a lot of what we what we experience as a diminished life in Christianity is the byproduct of our own disposition and our own attitude. We get aggravated with those people who, when you see them, you say, good morning. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. But stop getting an attitude with them. They may not be talking to you. They may be announcing to themselves. 
So that they so watch this because they know they got to deal with you talking about it. Ugh, driving through traffic kill me. Are y'all understand? Uh, let me let me let me. I, I'm not gonna tell you this, but I'm gonna do this morning. This morning. I had an experience this morning. Spirit spoke to me. I had I, I did something to a young lady who was standing on the side of the road. I followed the cues of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna cut across the yard on this. And and I picked her up, found out that I knew her sister as I was taking her to work after we waited on the tow truck to come to get a car that broke down on the side of the road, right? Now check this out. When I told her I was Pastor Anthony from around the corner and I saw her, her license plate was Calvary Alpha Psi, I saw that. I turned the corner. I can't go by that. There is somebody who's potentially connected to my bond that may need me. So I pulled over on the side of the road. When I pulled over on the side of the road, the post sheriff pulled up right next to me, rolled the window down because he saw me flip, pull over on the side of the road, flip my fashions on. He said, you all right? I said, I am. I stopped to help them. Right. And I, I, I almost, almost told him something, but I didn't. I said, I stopped to help them. He said, well, I'm on my way there. I said, well, I'll meet you there. He drove on down the road. I got out the car. I walked over to him. When I walked over to him, I didn't know him. There was a young lady in the driver's side. I walked over to the passenger side. She rolled the window down. There was a guy of another persuasion that was trying to help her jump her car. There was another guy of another persuasion that was standing there with her. That's what alarmed me to make the U-turn. So I went to the window and I said, I said, I'm a member of Capital Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. I noticed your license plate. Are you okay? Her response was like, yeah, she, she was on the phone. She said, wait a minute. She got out of, eventually got off the call, got out of the car, walked around to me. I told her who I was. She told me who her dad was. And that that's why the, the plate was on the back of the car. Y'all stay with me. Watch this. And then as a result of that, I told her who I was as it relates to where I was on my way to. I was on my way to the church. I passed around, right, right around the corner. This chick, this God is my witness. So oh, thank you. And she went to go. She, she went to speak it in tongues. I said, God is good. God is faithful. Y'all are mighty quiet. See, some folk would be like, mm, no, no. I don't know what God does here, but I know what God had done there. And then on the way to the place, I realized I knew a sister. I used to work with a sister. In fact, I preached for them. How many years ago? At least 12, 15 years ago, before I became pastor in Ohio. I preached at the church because I used to work with the lady. It just, what I'm trying to show you is God's work is beyond our comprehension, but we've got to be willing right, to do what God has pur purposed now, us to do. I'm only to to um, so, that's me. Yes, man. Question up there. I stand here tonight after we created with the help of many people in this room. Who wants to know that? A million new jobs. More jobs. We need to watch you. Seducing the spirit. You know, seducing Some spirits are, are seductive. Seduction means, low. okay, it's a byproduct of what happened in you Genesis know, with Eve. The serpent was subtle. It's alluring. It is crafty. Uh, to what you've all it is hypnotic. And it is only successful, jobs. watch this, where there is no firm foundation yeah, that, uh, to be stood on. Where of there's a firm populism. foundation being stood uh, on, again, then you can't be easily seduced. Is that help? Ask if that help it. All right. I know how unfair it feels when a company overcharges you and gets away with it. Where your mic? Not anymore. We've written a bill to stop it all. It's called the Jones Remember, I think this is what she did say, so I'll let her say it. We're going to ban surprise resort fees that hotels charge on your bill. Those fees can cost up to $90 to a night at hotels. The part from where you are, resorts. it doesn't pull you or grab you. Right. It's an invitation. You're not a customer. It's an invitation. The dialogue between the serpent the and Eve is of a now, seductive clearly, spirit. Uh, and it it, 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 it pounces on doubt Democrats and disbelief. That's why I said if you're in a firm foundation, if you know your footing, then it's hard for you to be seduced. Uh, progressive agenda on the south. Je Thank you, Holy Spirit. Kind of Jesus was led by the Spirit. You're going to let me teach my class, Dick, or you're going to teach it. Right? To be tempted of the devil. 
The method of the devil is never different. He has no new tricks. So what he attempted to do was to engage in seductive behavior with Jesus by offering him things that he thought Jesus would bite on. Be careful of the offers you receive because not all of them are of God. But if you're standing on God, you know when God offers you something. Am I, am I making sense? Oh, I can't. I'm talking to the wife. We good? All right. Praise God. All right, all right, any more questions? Remember, the objective of seduction is departing. It wants you to move away from, to move off of. Now, watch this. You know, who's, you know who is not seduced? No. The one who has no faith. Yeah. The devil doesn't need to lure who he has. Am I making sense? Remember, I want you to go back. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. The giving heed is the departure. Y'all tracking? All right. All right, I'm going I'm to leave that right there. I'm going to leave that right there. Um, that's just, we just scratched the surface. We got quite a ways to go. Any, any other questions, thoughts, reflections? All right. All right. All right. That being said, y'all, I will, um, next week, next week, Minister Henderson will be teaching class. Please be here to support him. Um, we dispensed with the AM class for next week. There will be no AM Bible study next week. We will have Bible study next week at 7. Minister Henderson will be teaching that class. Um, it will not be this lesson. I gave latitude for him to teach as God led him. And we will come back to this lesson as your handout indicates on February the 22nd. Um, yeah, once we get back, all right, once we get back. All right, any other questions? We clear? Let's be mindful um, before I pray that we, um, we, 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 we stand the risk of, I think, maybe two or three funerals within the next couple of weeks. We know Friday, right, and then we'll get information as it comes in. Let's Let's just gear ourselves up to be supportive and be strength for these families, um, needing everybody who can be here to support, to be here. Um, I don't, is there a read past Friday? There is? You're not sure. All right, we haven't gotten the clarity. Um, there is a read pass. There is a read pass. That, all right. Okay. All right. All right, all right, let's be mindful. You all know what we do and how we do it, so let's make sure we represent uh, Christ in this place and to all of these families. All right, if there's nothing else, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Deke to pray aside tonight since he, since he made me pray earlier. Right. Father, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for what our ears have heard. God, we ask that you allow it to maturate in our spirits and let it become a part of our daily living. God, that we might become closer to you, think eternally, and not be easily seduced or pulled away from the things that you have for us. God, we ask you to continue to bless, heal, and touch those who are in need of you and in need of you most. God, as we prepare to leave this place, but never from your presence, we ask that you go with us, stand by us, lead us, and guide us until we can meet again. These are those familiar blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all be safe. Oh, I understand it's supposed to be windy.